Classic Restos is proudly brought to you by Shannon's Insurance, National Parts Depot and Penrite Oil. Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of Classic Restos. Of course not possible without the continued support of my major sponsors, Shannon's Insurance, National Parts Depot, based in the United States of America, and it's a big warm welcome to Penrite Oil, my latest acquisition to join the family of sponsors for Classic Restos. Before I go any further, how good are Shannon's Insurance? In fact, this return trip to the United States has been made possible from their ongoing support, but they're also around to help you as well. When you get a chance, why not pick up the phone and give Shannon's a call on 134646. Shannon's offer us just so much more. You can also visit Shannon's online at shannons.com.au. And while you're there, sign up and become a member of the Shannon's Club. And Classic Restos has obtained one of the largest global parts supplier to make your American Ford or GM restoration easy. You can contact them for a catalogue and they ship to Australia and New Zealand every day. And my the latest major sponsor to Classic Restos just happens to offer us the finest in oil and coolants. They've been established since 1926. They're a family business and they're Australian owned. What a sensational brand and equally a sensational product and I am proud to have them on board. For more information on any of the major sponsors, see more at classicrestos.com.au. And on today's show, I return to the United States of America to bring you the Woodward Dream Cruise. But before I get there, I'd like to show you some things along the way. At the moment, I'm here in Los Angeles at the Peterson Automotive Museum, around about a 40 minute drive from LA Airport. How cool is this? United States of America, Los Angeles, and this, the Peterson Museum. If there's one thing that we all have in common, especially in Southern California, it's the automobile. To some, the automobile is an appliance, but to us, it's a passion. The two unique features that separate the Peterson Automotive Museum from other automotive museums is the streetscape diorama and the rotating exhibit spaces. It keeps the opulence of the museum fresh, assuring that visitors keep coming back. This multi-storey mecca museum hosts a collection in 3,000 square feet. There are about 150 vehicles on display at any one time, with more in on-site storage, awaiting the chance to go on exhibition. The rotating exhibits can range from 100% Peterson vehicles to 90% on loan. OK, with me now we have Chris Brown, the Marketing Director of the Peterson Museum. How are you, Chris? Great, Fletch. How are you doing? Great. Now, look, a lot of you might look at this guy and think, where do we know this guy from? Well, he was on the Rex to Riches TV show. Uh, correct. I was, uh, I was on two seasons of Rex to Riches, yeah. about 16 episodes, <laughs> and uh, a lot of great muscle cars. Absolutely. Uh, working uh, there with Barry White there at uh, Corona, Barry's Speed Shop. Must have been interesting times back then. Oh, absolutely. It was, uh, you know, it was a wild ride trying to find all the cars and then trying to find all the parts, yeah. coming up with a creative design and then building something really interesting that we hope would sell for a lot of money. Not a stupid question, but you must be enjoying it. I mean, what a place to come to work each day. <laughs> yeah, in fact, uh, one of the things I like the most about this is meeting interesting people like yourself that are into cars and uh, hearing about everybody's passions. You know, the, the great thing about this collection is it's very eclectic. So there's something for everybody here. We have a lot of Hollywood and celebrity vehicles in the collection, from the Batmobile uh, to Speed Racer. Uh, we've got uh, cars that were owned by people like Elvis Presley, Rita Hayworth, Clark Gable, you name it. We've got a little bit of everything. Moving through the Peterson Museum, there's nothing like the ground pounders from the 60s. And here, first cab off the rank in 1967, Dodge hosting a 426 Hemi. Where did this come from, Chris? Uh, this car is called the WO23, and it's a very rare automobile. Um, they were built specifically for super stock drag racing. There's no doubt about it. I mean, these cars back in their day, you could go out and go to the grocery store and come back before every other car in the street. <laughs> Absolutely. You'd probably be out of gas by the time you did that, though. <laughs> uh, these were pretty thirsty, but it wasn't about miles per gallon. It was about 
quarter mile elapsed times. This is a pretty rare car. They only built 55 of these, and they, uh, they, they made them as bare bones as possible. There's no radio, there's no heater. It's not even any hubcaps on it. You're looking at the bare steelies. Absolutely. I mean, some of the darts, too, they came in grey primer because the market was for drag races. They, they weren't for public sale to people on the street. Exactly. In fact, this car came in white. That was the color you got because they assumed you were going to put graphics on it, repaint it, yeah. make it your, your race car. 1957 Lincoln, Jane Mansfield's car. What an incredible vehicle. Yeah, isn't it an appropriate shade of pink? for uh, an actress like Jane Mansfield. And, uh, you know, it's a Lincoln premiere, so it, uh, it, <laughs> it's a fitting name for somebody in, in Hollywood. And, and the car comes with tons of luxuries. I mean, you look at the dash in this car, and not only is it there a lot of chrome, but lots of cool little gadgets and levers and all this kind of crazy stuff. Even has air conditioning, which in the 1950s would have been pretty rare. Yeah. The fins on this car are huge and long. I mean, they're, the fins are longer than most cars nowadays so yeah. <laughs> you know it, it pretty much dwarfs anything else on the road and yeah, you kind of got a Hyundai Sonata in each rear quarter panel absolutely uh, there's certainly enough material there for that <laughs> the seats are, are very cushy and comfortable but they don't offer much lateral support so if you do go around a corner you better hold on yeah. Uh, yeah. because you may not have a seat belt in the car to begin with so I mean, this is, <laughs> obviously this is uh, the days before the high density foam and the bolstering seats and, and we're, we're aware of that but just the structure of the seats the way they look um, how padded they are it's just just amazing yeah. Chris looking around the front of the car I mean it's got a front bigger than Walmart <laughs> Absolutely. And, and if you look at that, you can see some of the Lincoln Futura concept car in the front end of this. And that concept car went on to be the Batmobile. Speaking of vehicles that are unique, what do we got here, Chris? This is a 1953 Dodge Power Wagon, but you might notice that uh, something looks a little odd. Mate, this has got more twist than chubby checker. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it's got a Willock swivel frame conversion. Uh, Willock was a company in Toronto, Canada. Uh, you know, a lot of logging around there, and the trucks would, in that cold air with a lot of weight in the back of them, trying to traverse those uh, logs, they'd, they'd snap the frames or crack them. So they came up with the idea of, well, let's make the, the chassis swivel. So they would take a Dodge Power Wagon, cut the chassis in half, and they had a weld-in adapter that, that allowed the truck to, to swivel back and forth. And then there were chains to limit the amount of travel so the, they couldn't totally flip. Mm. And then once you got on a flat surface, mm. there were two pins that you, you slid in, yep. and it would lock it in place, so then you had a typical chassis. Okay, 1958 Ford Ranchero. Have a look at this. Almost like a luxury car turned into a ute. Absolutely. You know, you had the... Uh, you had all the style you could ever ask for in a car like this, or is it a truck? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I'm um, led to believe, too, they're inspired by the Australian market, too, because we were the first to call them utes, obviously short for utility. Absolutely. In 1934, Ford introduced the ute uh, body style to Australia, and uh, somewhere along the line they decided, hey, you know, this might work in the United yeah. States. So in 1957, uh, they brought a, a, a uh, Ranchero to market, yeah. and they used the... Uh, the Ford two-door station wagon body uh, as the basis for this vehicle. Well, I hope you're really enjoying today's show here at the Peterson Museum in Los Angeles. Of course, not possible without the continued support of Shannon's Insurance, National Parts Depot and Penrite Oil. Back with more right after this. Welcome back. We're here at the Peterson Automotive Museum here in Los Angeles. Now, we're down in the vault. This is uh, the high security part of the building. The average person on the street cannot get into here. Chris, we're just putting our big toe in the water down here. Tell us more. <laughs> There's about 150 vehicles down here in the vault, and every one of them's got a great story. So there's, there's way more than we could ever cover on this show, but... Uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a really special part of the museum. We, we have about 300 vehicles in the collection, and we have more than that uh, in the building at any one time because we, we always have vehicles on loan um, in, in our exhibits. And so we, we have the space down here to park the vehicles that are not on display upstairs. Now, Chris, before we start talking about this Rolls-Royce, Steve McQueen's Wasp down there. The Wasp was a really interesting car, though. It's a 1953 Hudson Wasp, and uh, it was the car that McQueen, Steve McQueen, drove uh, when he just wanted to be kind of under the radar. Yeah. So, 
uh, it's unrestored. It's uh, you know the paint's a little faded. There's a couple of chips and dings here and there, but uh, it's got so much personality, so much character. I got to move on. What about the Hangover fans? Everyone loves the first Hangover movie, the Mercedes convertible. It's right here. Yeah, we have uh, one of the. Uh, well, five or so Mercedes convertibles that they use to make one car in the movie. Uh, that's something a lot of people don't really realize is that when you see this beautiful car in the movie get destroyed by the end of the movie, they didn't just take one car to do that. They actually took a handful. Amazing. Talking of stars, President Eisenhower, the Chrysler stretch limo, again a convertible. What an outstanding car. Yeah, it's a uh, originally a 1952 Imperial uh, Parade Phaeton. In 1956, Chrysler took it back and rebodied the car. Uh, but it served uh, President Eisenhower. It's also served uh, President Nixon, and some of the early astronauts have ridden in that car. Wow. This Rolls Royce behind us now. I've never seen anything like this in my life. I mean, there's a lot of vehicles here that have uh, that are hard to put words to. What is the story here? I mean, I've got to ask: How many of these were made, and why, when? One. <laughs> There's only one of these uh, in existence. And it, the car uh, has a really interesting history that we're still learning. Uh, in 1925, the car came out with a completely different body on it that was a little bit more pedestrian, uh, more run of the mill. Um, at some point in time, a Maharaja had owned the car. Um, and uh, then it went through another owner who got bored with the body, took it to Yonkiera in Belgium. And they threw the body work away, and they built this beautiful shape that you see here behind me. And it's, I mean, it's a stunning car. It's incredible and difficult to drive, uh, believe it or not. Not just because it's big. That's, that's probably the easiest part. Um, you have a rear view mirror about that big. You have no windows in the back of the car. You just have louvers to look out. So you kind of need a spotter if you're going to back up. Um, big, cumbersome car with a big six-cylinder Rolls-Royce motor. Um, so I think at some point in time uh, when it was just an old car, uh, somebody kind of got tired of it. And we have photos of this car sitting in a wrecking yard in New Jersey uh, in the weeds with the paint peeling off of it. The car went on to be rescued uh, by a, name, a guy named uh, Max Obi, who painted it a very gaudy gold color, put it in the back of a semi, paraded around the country, called it the $100,000 Rolls-Royce sports car. For a while it disappeared. It ended up in a uh, car showroom in Japan and it was white at that time. I just can't believe its length and the, and the height of this thing. I mean, it's just amazing. Yes, yeah, it's, it's 22 feet long, you know, from the raked radiator grill all the way back to the, the end of that tail fin. Mm. And it's just so immense, you know, it, it, it commands a presence wherever it goes. Chris, I just want to thank you so much for being on today's show. The beginning of the American editions, making our way through to the Woodward Cruise in Detroit. Uh, you've come in on a Saturday. Uh, what can I say, mate? Thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you, Fletch. Anything for classic restos. Uh, we're proud to be on the show. And, uh, you know, if you want to find out more information about the museum, visit our website. It's peterson.org. It's P-E-T-E-R-S-E-N. Org. A real pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Thank you, Fletch. Good, Good seeing you. I hope you're really enjoying Classic Restos. The DVD boxed sets, along with other Classic Restos merchandise, can be found at classicrestos.com.au. And while you're there, check out the major sponsors as well. Hope you're enjoying today's show. Back with more in just a moment. Well, we've left Los Angeles, and here we are in Ypsilanti, Michigan, and we've got Bill here, the director of the board to a once-was Hudson dealership and now museum. How are you, Bill? Pretty good, Fletch. Glad to have you guys here. Thank you very much. Couldn't uh, knock this opportunity back. What a sensational old building. Tell us a little bit about the history here. Yeah, the building was built in the early 1900s and became a Dodge dealership in 1917, shortly after John and Horace uh, started Dodge Motor Car Company. We were the first Dodge dealership outside of the city of Detroit. Became a Hudson dealership in, in 1933 and continued as a Hudson dealership until Hudson went out of business in 1957. And then the son of the proprietor uh, continued selling Hudson parts, used Hudsons, and other used cars until the museum uh, building became a museum in 1996. It really became a museum in an effort to, to preserve the, the, the rather very original Hudson dealership. I think it's amazing um, how Hudson survived. I mean, let's face it, they had some incredible competition by the big three. Yeah. 
Yeah, but Hudson didn't do badly itself. Uh, in 1929, it was third in sales, right behind Ford and Chevrolet. Uh, so yeah, they, they did all right all by themselves. Is it isn't it good to hear what you would kind of call, I guess, an underdog just hold itself so well in the marketplace back then? Yeah, uh, well, they did so. They were competitive in NASCAR racing in the 1940s, which boosted them through the 40s and early 50s. Uh, uh, they also uh, had a couple other uh, models that they brought out. The Hudson car was a little uh, higher priced than Ford and Chevrolet, but uh, Hudson has the wisdom to bring out a car called the Terraplane that competed with Ford and Chevy back in the 1930s. So they're a pretty adaptive company. Just give us a quick run through of the types of cars that you can find here when you're lucky enough to visit this museum. What have we got here, Bill? Yeah, we're really trying the automotive history, telling the automotive history of the Ypsilanti area. And it all began after World War II with the founding of the Kaiser Fraser Company that occupied our bomber plant. So we've got Kaisers and Frasers built from 47 to 1953 here. And then uh, Preston Tucker lived here in Ypsilanti and had his workshop behind his house here in town. And before he moved to Chicago and, and bought a factory in Chicago, he did all of his work here in Ypsilanti. And we don't have an original Tucker. Uh, there's only 49 of them left. And uh, uh, the last one tried an auction for a million and a half and didn't sell. But we do have a uh, fiberglass uh, uh, Preston Tucker car that was in the movie uh, Tucker uh, on display. And, and from the distance, it looks like the real thing. Well, it'll do me because, I mean, the Tucker, what an amazing car. And getting back to how tough business was back then, competing against the big three, Preston Tucker had some fantastic ideas. He had seat belts, safety features, fuel injection. He wanted a torque converter on each wheel. There's a whole plethora of stuff he wanted to incorporate into the car. He just got knocked out of the ring. Yeah, he... Uh Actually, probably the biggest problem he had, he was a little bit short of funds. And uh, he did some fundraising technique to try to, to generate money. And uh, uh, the U.S. government got concerned about some of the fundraising efforts. And uh, that sort of led to his demise. But yes, a very innovative man. Bill, wonderful catching up. Thank you so much. Uh, this is a Sunday afternoon here and uh, Bill's coming. And these guys are wonderful when you come over to the United States. Uh, they open the doors for you and, and they'll, they'll show you things that uh, you just don't see every day. And Bill, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Fletch. <laughs> if you'd like to do a Detroit tour and see the beautiful surrounding areas of Detroit, events museum of course the Woodward Cruise we're taking expressions of interest now for 2014 for a Fletch tour send me an email via classicrestos.com.au Ypsilanti Michigan the once was heartbeat the nerve center of a productive nation I am standing in the very last Hudson dealership building still standing here today in all of its exuberant glory here's a little bit about what you'll find when you walk into this amazing historic landmark the Tucker 48 had 67 safety features designed into the automobile when the rest of the industry practically ignored safety. The Tucker's 48 engine and drivetrain were together in the rear, similar to modern automobiles with the engine and drivetrain together in the front. 51 Tucker 48s were assembled, 49 survive. Recently, $1.5 million did not reach the minimum bid for a Tucker at auction, and Preston Tucker died in 1953. The Hudson Motor Car Company started production in Detroit in 1909. Hudson was the third in production behind Ford and Chevrolet in 1929. The step-down designed Hudson was introduced in 1948. This body design placed the passenger compartment down inside the perimeter of the frame. That body became the fabulous Hudson Hornet in 1951 and dominated NASCAR racing until 1954. The Ypsilanti Automotive Heritage Museum features the last original Hudson dealership in the world. The first Kayser and Fraser cars were launched for the 1947 model year and featured the first true post-war sheet metal with fender lines that ran from front to rear. Features included aluminum alloy pistons, an automatic choke, double acting hydraulic brakes, independent suspension, curved rear window and a fresh air heater. The Traveller line of cars featuring an early hatchback design which converted a family sedan to a pickup van was introduced in 1949. Kayser Fraser second generation style was introduced in 1951. Also in 1951, a low priced compact car called the Henry J was introduced. A rebadged Henry J called the Allstate was sold by Sears and Roebuck department stores. 
The Kayser Darren sport car with a fiberglass body was designed in 1952. It featured a sliding door and unfortunately was powered by the Henry J6 cylinder engine. A total of 435 were built by the time production ended in 1954. The final year for Kayser in America was 1955. The first generation Chevrolet Corvairs were built at Willow Run from 1960 through to 1964. All Corvairs featured six cylinder horizontal opposed air curled engines with the transmission installed in the rear. Ralph Nader published his book Unsafe at Any Speed, critical of the handling of the Corvair in 1965. The second generation of Corvair was built at Willow Run from 1965 to 69 and styling was influenced by the Corvette Stingray. And of course General Motors also built some wonderful automatic transmissions. The GM powertrain ended, the manufacture of high dramatic transmissions and closed in 2010. Well, I hope you've really enjoyed today's episode of Classic Restos featuring the Peterson Museum in Los Angeles and the Hudson Museum in Michigan. Now, keep in mind, classicrestos.com.au is the website that you need for the DVD boxed sets of the show, along with other Classic Restos merchandise as well. As I say at the end of every episode of Classic Restos, until next week, please ride and drive safe. I'm Fletch, and I thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to like Classic Restos on Facebook. Facebook.com forward slash Classic Restos TV and episodes can be seen at channons.com.au Classic Restos is proudly brought to you by Shannon's Insurance, National Parts Depot and Penrite Oil.